Welcome back to the Junius Maltby channel. Intermixed with the year 2021 as we go forward, we will often be visiting coinage that dates back to the beginning of Western civilization. It'll be sort of a journey that you and I go on together, the viewers, myself, Mrs. Maltby, exploring as far back as the Greeks and the Romans and going essentially coin by coin until we get to the story of more modern times and fiat, uh, unbacked paper currency. But it's going to be a fun educational journey for myself and you. And today, we're going to start off in Greece. Those are the first coins we're going to take a look at today. Now, a lot of the coins we're going to look at are originals, but there are going to be many that are also copies just because the original coins to be handled and acquired would be prohibitively expensive. However, the copies that we will be looking at are museum quality uh, replicas of essentially the, the exact same dimensions and the designs that were in the dies when it came to the process of producing these museum replicas uh, for discussions like this. Some of them were also noted as being fakes or copies uh, on the coin themselves and it's, it's kind of obvious when they stamp it into the coin because there is a concern for counterfeits out there. I know myself, I'm very opposed to counterfeit coins. Some of you have your feelings as well, and uh, they need to be dealt with. Oftentimes, these coins are sold as copies, and it's important to trace the lineage, the genealogy of any coin like this, especially ones with antiquities um, tied to that type of topic, where you're not fooling purchasers or trying to defraud someone by selling them a counterfeit. These ones are actually passed on as copies for the intent and purpose of just being able to handle something that's of historical size and uh, similar specifications. But if you sent them into NGC or PCGS or any of the coin grading firms, they would immediately recognize the copy. Now the stator you're looking at on the screen today, that is an original gold stator but we will get to that coin at a later date. We do have some staters that we will be doing videos on as well. The first coin we are starting with is a Greek drachma from 494 to 461 BC. Again, this first coin and the subsequent six will be copies, and the ones, a lot of the other ones after that will be original coins that we're gonna take a look at. But this one is a copy of a silver drachma. Now this drachma originates from Brutium region in Italy, which was Magna Graecia. As you know, the Greeks conquered much of southern Italy and Sicily. On the obverse of this coin, we see a charioteer facing the right side, and on the reverse is a hare running to the right. Now rabbits and hares on ancient coins was somewhat of a theme and there's some interesting information regarding the presence of this hair on the reverse of the drachma here. And we're going to get into more details on this coin. So give me your time, please. We're going to go into the uh, purchasing power of it as well. Uh, but at rabbits and hares, this is from Coin Week, on ancient coins. The leopardi are a family of mammals, including some 60 species of rabbits and hares with a wide range of symbolic associations. Good luck fertility, cleverness, swiftness, at all. The European rabbit, Erectolagus cuniculus, and hare, Lepus europaeus, have a long history in Western art, mythology, and folklore. On a coin dated after 460 BC, the nearby city of Locroix shows a hare leaping over an unturned amphora. A century later, circa 360, the city of Croton, place the hair on the reverse of its small silver diabols with its own traditional symbol of the tripod on the obverse. Now the hair in Magna Graecia, many Greek cities adopted symbolic or mythical animals as badges or totems. Athens chose the owl due to its association with Athena. Corinth chose the pegasus. For Sisychus in Anatolia, it was the tuna fish and so on. Americans have a similar custom, the dolphin for Miami, the colt for Indianapolis, uh, the bear for Chicago. Several cities in Magna Graecia 
the region of southern Italy and Sicily, settled by Greek colonists beginning in the 8th century BC, adopted the leaping hare as a distinctive symbol on their classical era coinage. The story begins with Anaxilus, son of Cretans. In 494 BC, he seized power at Regium, or region known today as Regio Calabria, at the tip of the boot of Italy, and soon extended his rule to Sicily. Anaxilus is credited with importing Greek hares to Sicily for the aristocratic sport of hunting. A leaping hare appears on his small silver litra at Regium as early as 480 BC. When his mule chariot, Biga, team won in the Olympic Games, he placed that image on his coins. Coinage is conservative, and this basic design, a mule chariot on the obverse, leaping hare on the reverse, was continued for generations. Neighboring cities that allied with Regium, or came under its control, soon adopted the leaping hare as a symbol, notably Messana. Early coinage of Messana closely copied Regium's design, changing only the ethnic the inscription giving the name of the city. About 420 BC, Messana issued a magnificent silver tetradrachm depicting the nature god Pan seated on a rock playing with a leaping hare. Another tetradrachm from this period shows the hare leaping over a head of Pan. The ancient drachma. The name drachma is derived from the verb drasomai or grasp. It is believed that the same word with the meaning of handful or handle is found in Linear B tablets of the Mycenaean pylos. Initially, a drachma was a fistful, a grasp of six oboli or oboli, metal sticks, literally spits, used as a form of currency as early as 1100 BC and being a form of bullion, bronze, copper, or iron ingots denominated by weight, a hoard of over 150 rod-shaped oboli was uncovered at Herion of Argos in Peloponnese. Six of them are displayed at the Numismatic Museum of Athens. It was the standard unit of silver coinage at most ancient Greek mints, and the name oboi was used to describe a coin that was one-sixth of a drachma. The notion that drachma derived from the word for fistful was recorded by Heraclides of Pontos. I never pronounce all of these words right. They're just too difficult for me. This was from 387 to 312 BC, who was informed by the priests of Herion that Phidon, king of Argos, dedicated rod-shaped oboli to Herion. Similar information about Phidon's oboli was also recorded at the Perian Chronicle. Ancient Greek coins normally had distinctive names in daily use. The Athenian tetradrachm was called owl. The agenetic stator or stator was called the chelon. The Corinthian stator was called hippos or horse, and so on. Each city would mint its own and have them stamped with recognizable symbols of the city known as a badge in numismatics, along with suitable inscriptions, and they would often be referred to either by the name of the city or the image depicted on the coin. The exact exchange value of each was determined by the quantity and quality of the metal, which reflected on the reputation of each mint. The 5th century Athenian tetradrachm, or four drachma coin, was perhaps the most widely used coin in the Greek world prior to the time of Alexander the Great, along with the Corinthian stator. It featured the helmeted profile bust of Athena on the obverse front and an owl on the reverse in the back of the coin. In daily use, they were called owls, hence the proverb, an owl to Athens, referring to something that was in plentiful supply, like coals to Newcastle. The reverse is featured on the national side of the Greek Euro coin, the modern Greek Euro coin. Uh, drachma were minted on different weight standards at different Greek mints. The standard that came to be most commonly used with, was the Athenian or Attic one, 
which weighed a little over 4.3 grams. After Alexander the Great's conquests, the name drachma was used in many of the Hellenistic kingdoms in the Middle East, including the Ptolemaic Kingdom in Alexandria and the Parthian Empire, based in what is modern-day Iran. The Arabic unit of currency known as the dirham, known from pre-Islamic times and afterwards, inherited its name from the drachma, or didrachm. The, di the dirham is still the name of the official currencies of Morocco and the United Arab Emirates, and the Armenian dram also derives its name from the drachma. Now, one of the more fascinating parts of any coin's story, whether it's ancient coinage like this, even coins that are not ancient by any means, but just coins from the 18th, 19th, or 17th, 16th century, is what were the values of those pieces of precious metal? What could it purchase you? What goods and services? What was the compensation for various labor? What did that coin buy? And it's difficult with ancient coinage because it was just different times, different economies. But I did pull up some information to look at and read through on what were the values of these drachmas. And of course, it's open for debate with some scholars, but we'll just read through a couple of pieces to see what did these little 4.3 or so grams of silver buy a person back then. Reading here, it says it's difficult to estimate comparative exchange rates with modern currency because the range of products produced by economies of centuries gone by were different from today, which makes purchase power parity, or PPP, calculations very difficult. However, some historians and economists have estimated that in the 5th century BC, a drachma had a rough value of around 25 US dollars in the year 1990, or the equivalent to $46.50. So we'll just call it like 50 or so dollars in the year 2015. Now, silver has gone up since then. There's been some changes as well. And I think it's difficult to really land on the valuations of silver today accurately because of, you know, what we talk about with the things that takes place in the silver market. Now, if in 2015 it was worth around $50 in purchase power uh, or value, I would say more in line with, again, with today's values, the increase in silver price since then, let, let's call it like 75. Let's just go up. Let's, we'll meet them halfway. I think it'd be more like 100, but we'll, we'll say anywhere from 50 to $75 is, is the value. Whereas classical historians regularly say that in the heyday of ancient Greece, the 5th and 4th centuries, the daily wage for a skilled worker or a hoplite was one drachma. And for a heliast or a juror, half a drachma since around 425 BC. Modern commentators derived from Xenophon that half a drachma per day, 360 days per year, would provide a comfortable subsistence for the poor citizens. For the head of a household in 355 BC, around that time. Earlier, in 422 BC, we also see in Aristophanes, Wasps, line 300 to 302, that the daily half drachma of a juror is just enough for the daily subsistence of a family of three. And that's just with half a drachma. Half of this little coin worth of silver was enough for a day's costs and expenditures for a family of three. And a lot of things back then, again, were, you're going to see shortly here, were measured in, like, you know, how much wheat did this buy? Because if you look at the, the origins of sound money and, and the way humans began to transact and barter was, how do I get that wheat? I don't have any wheat, but I have this other medium of exchange that might represent X amount of wheat or X amount of cattle or meat or other labor or other goods of some kind. You know, maybe he has something to trade, like weapons or something that he can make. So again, when we look at where coinage came from, it was in the past discussions we've had on how did humans land on gold and silver. That's not really the purpose of these series of videos, but it is important to consider, you know, how did we get to the point where, okay, let's, let's use this as our medium of exchange. 
and that has to do with earlier discussions with it whereas the, you know the attributes of money um, all of the different uh, things that gold and silver are good at that make it such an, uh, an easy decision when it came to humans trying to figure out a common medium of exchange which happened to be gold and silver a modern person might think of one drachma as the rough equivalent of a skilled worker's daily pay in the place where they lived, which could be as low as $1 or as high as $100 depending on the country. Fractions and multiples of the drachma were minted by many states, most notably the Ptolemaic Egypt, which minted large coins in gold, silver, and bronze. Notable Ptolemaic coins included the gold pentadrachma and the octadrachma and the silver tetradrachm, the decadrachm and the pentakidecadrachm. This was especially noteworthy as it would not be until the introduction of the Gulden Groschen in 1486 that coins of substantial size, particularly in silver, would be minted in significant quantities. Denominations of ancient Greek drachma. The weight of the silver drachma was approximately, as we said, 4.3 grams, or 0.15 ounces. So just a little over a tenth and a half, or exactly a tenth and a half of an ounce. Although weights varied significantly from one state to another, it was divided into six obols of 0.72 grams, which were subdivided into four tetartamoria, or 0.18 grams, decimal 18 grams, one of the smallest coins ever struck, approximately five to seven millimeters in diameter. That's quite small, and you can see it down here in the lower left part of the screen. That's just a half a tetramorian, if I'm pronouncing that right, tetartamorian. Now, in further researching this topic of what did these coins purchase, I, I stumbled into a discussion among others debating the very issue, and there was an entry of some pretty good information, well-researched, that I figured I would share with all of you here, and we'll just read through that as well. And it says, at the beginning of the 5th century BC in Athens, a metabos of barley, about 52.2 liters, cost one AR drachma, Plutarch Solon 23, with a hemidrachm a day, the average daily wage for a common worker. You would have bought 26 liters of barley or 18 kilograms of barley equaling around looks like 60,000 calories a day. In the same years at the time of Solon, a sheep cost one drachma. How many calories can you take from a sheep? In the opinion, it is also wrong that only the richest modern economies does one begin to generate the massive surpluses sufficient to buy Ferraris. The ancient Ferrari was wine. This statement will become clear later in the post, and massive surpluses were generated in large sizes with the work of slaves in mines and fields. And the author will return to that topic later. And he's going to report in chronological order the information that he's found concerning wages and prices related to inflation in ancient times. So 638, 558 BC, the time of Solon, one drachma equaled one metamos of barley or 52 liters or one sheep. Now at that time around or just a little bit later 538 BC to 522 BC this was the time of um, Polycrates a tyrant of Samos and we know that Democede of Croton the personal physician of the tyrant received a lavish wage of 8 AR tetradrachmas per day. In 489 BC Athens to fit out an equipment of a trireme ship, you would have spent 1,500 AR tetradrachms, 1,500 tetradrachms to equip a trireme. In the same years to build the Parthenon, the city spent more or less, it looks like here, let me count the zeros, it looks like a million AR tetradrachmas to build the Parthenon. Interesting. Slaves in BC, about the fifth century BC, it would have cost around 10 tetradrachms for the basic mines or fields worker to 300 tetradrachmas for a slave with specific technical knowledge, architects, 
um, computist and, and lettered educated. The surplus. We know that in Athens, after Mytiades died in 48 BC, Themistocles decided to build a new fleet using the silver mines of Laurion, discovered in 483 BC. To hasten the fleet assembly operations, he made the following proposal. Rent the mine to the 100 richest citizens of Athens. They would immediately pay the rent to build the fleet, one talent each to build 100 trireme. In return, they could exploit the mine at will for one year. Xenophon tells us that Nicias, a rich Athenian citizen, set to work 1,000 slaves in the Laurion. Let's do the math now. The cost of the mine to rent was one talent of silver, circa 26,196 grams, or 1,502 tetradrachmas. The cost of 1,000 slaves was around 10,000 tetradrachmas. Total cost for Nicias sounds like it was 11,502 tetradrachmas. We know that the mining output of silver for a single slave was one obol a day. So a thousand slaves would result in roughly 1,000 obols a day or, or 365,000 obols in a year, which is around 15,208 tetradrachmas. Hopefully I haven't lost you yet. So his surplus in one year was around 3,706 tetradrachmas because his cost, again, was around 15, looks like 15, 11,502 tetradrachmas, but he was uh, yielding around 15,208 tetradrachmas worth of silver. So again, that's a pretty significant profit margin for this rich Athenian citizen that rented the silver mine at Laurion. Now let's go to wine, 5th century BC. Daudoro Siculo tells us that an amphora of wine costs as much as a slave. So cheap wine costs as much as a poor slave, 10 tetradrachms. Fine wine would cost as much as a fine slave, 300 tetradrachms. This means that only rich people could afford good wine in large amounts for symposium. Those people could have generated massive surpluses. And how they drank wine? Certainly not pouring it from the amphora into cow's horns as barbarians did. The Greek rich men used magnificent craters and sophisticated, if I'm pronouncing this right, oinokai, elegant bronze and silver cantharos, luxury objects, for which there was not a real need. A dipper of clay would have the same function but they only serve to show that some people can afford all that stuff. The symposium was a status symbol, such as a Ferrari today. The cost of barley, oxen, and inflation from the 6th to the 4th century BC. At the time of Solon, early decades of the 6th century BC, a metamos of wheat cost around one drachma. In 422 BC, the price reached the amount of six drachmas. An ox under Solon cost five drachmas. In 410 BC, 51 drachmas. In the 4th century, from 70 to 100 drachmas. The purchasing power of money in Attica and other parts of Greece had collapsed. From the beginning of the 6th century BC to 400 BC, about 200%, and from 400 to 336 BC, another 400%, with an overall decrease of 800%. Scholars estimated that before the Peloponnesian War, a modest family of four, at the lower limit of subsistence needed, 480 drachmas a year for food, bread, water, olives and figs, clothing, house rent, and other basic needs. After the war, the need increased to 600 drachmas. So once again, war, dating back to the beginning of time, to the roots and the origins of Western civilization, war increased the hardship for the lives of the people because of inflation. Inescapable law of economics. Inflation, again, driving up the prices of the things that people need to live. Now let's look at the real estate back then, well, to buy a house in Athens, at the time of Socrates, 
you could have spent around 300 drachmas for a poor hovel. And if you wanted a luxurious villa, well, you'd have to spend around 12,000 drachmas. Now, back then, for heating, most people relied upon wood. And in order to have a delivery of firewood during the time of Socrates to your house, uh, well, you would have to have someone do that, or you'd have to do it yourself as far with a donkey to load it up. And that would cost around two drachmas to have that done. Now, for olive oil, one of the main substances that people relied upon for cooking for all sorts of things back at that time period. I mean, it, it itself was almost a type of currency, although it would spoil and it wasn't as transportable as coinage. It was of high value. To buy a matrice of olive oil, the Attic matrice was the primary liquid measure of the ancient Greeks. It was the equivalent to about 39.4 liters or about nine gallons. So for nine gallons, you'd have to spend three tetradrachmas to have about that nine gallon mark of olive oil. At the pet shop, at the time of Socrates, an ox cost around 50 to 100 drachmas, depending on the weight and the age. A sheep, around 10 to 20 drachmas. An ordinary horse, around 300 drachmas. In ancient Greece, trained dogs were luxury goods. Alcibiades, to buy his famous dog, spent 7,000 drachmas. That's incredible. Let's see a menu. In 2,400 years ago, you would have gone to eat in a modest tavern in Athens. Around 387 BC, you might have read the following menu. Chicken, liverwurst, one hemiable. Hemiable. Olives and cabbage side dish, one hemiable. Chickpeas and lupins, one hemiable. Bread, one obol. Dried fish with vegetables, two obols, three obols if capers were a side dish. Sea urchins, four obols. Octopus, four obols. Thrushes, six obols. An eel, ten obols. A cup of mint tea, believed to be an aphrodisiac, one chalcos, or one-eighth of an obol. The clothing at the time, in the early 4th century B.C., an ordinary woolen chilton cost 10 drachmas. A hymathion, a cloak to wear over the chiton, 4 tetradrachmas. An ampule of unguent cost 2 drachmas if poor, but some luxury unguents arrived to cost 1,000 drachmas per ampule. Now, there was an economic crisis the end of the 4th century BC, after the death of Alexander the Great, the Greek population lived in a time of deep economic crisis because prices had a frightening surge. While wages did not rise in step with prices, the price for a metamos of wheat rose from 6 to 10 drachmas, for a metamos of barley from 3 to 5 drachmas. Much less increased the daily wage of a common worker from three obols in the time of Pericles to four obols. The same wage, four obols a day for hoplites in those days, it was common saying in Athens to live on four obols is life, meaning a poor condition of fatigue and misery, to live a four obols life. So that was like a saying referring to living miserably or with want. You would just say, oh, to live a, a four obols life, huh? That must be a very meager existence on just four obols. And a reminder, the, the obols is a smaller denomination. If you look back on that chart we talked about earlier, a drachma is six obols, and that weighs in at 4.3 grams. The four obols we just referred to would be about 2.85 grams. Again, with the, the main, the drachma, the main currency being six. And the obol itself as, as just a unit is about 0.72 grams of silver. That would be the obol, decimal 72 grams. Now the author with these uh, pieces of information closes uh, talking about the cost of shoes during the third century BC from uh, Herodos in his mime chapter 7, I believe, set to Alexander in Egypt, he tells a story of two rich ladies at a shoemaker's shop. 
A pair of luxury sandals cost 100 drachmas, a silver attic mine. <laughs> it's a lot of silver. The shoekeeper tells the two ladies about another pair of sandals sold for five gold staters to a dancer who performs his dance for four derricks a day. At the end of the so story, he sells the ladies three pairs of sandals for seven derricks. We must consider that gold was worth less against some of the manufactured goods, especially luxury footwear, in a country where most people walked barefoot. This was just video one, an introduction to the drachmas. We're going to be taking a look at several drachmas and stator coins during the course of this historical walk through coinage. Uh, you can always come back to this video to reference some of the purchasing power and strength. We'll try to remember it and review it as we go forward. Uh, but from this point forward, when we discuss the drachmas and the coins of ancient Greece, we're going to more just look at the designs of them, uh, as well as, of course, what might have been taking place historically at that time. And that might also lead to uh, discussions as far as the purchasing power and the economic uh, unfoldings taking place during each particular coin's time. So thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you on the next one.